There we go. So that should be showing the community meeting notes. And with that, kick off here. I got the meeting notes link in the chat for Zoom. So if everyone can drop in their attendance. And I'd like to invite anyone to go ahead and introduce themselves if they're new to the meeting. I will actually start off. I was briefly introduced last week, but I am going to, I will be helping run some of the um, community meetings going forward. My name is Kat Morgan, um, previous canonical Red Hat and Dell, uh, currently working um, for Kong and um, leveraging Kubevert for personal side projects and some ambitious other goals as well. We'll see how, how that goes, but I'm excited to be part of the community now and getting back. And um, I will open the floor to anyone else who cares to introduce themselves. All right, I'm gonna take that as a thank you, no thank you. And so for our agenda today, So I what think, are we going through now? I don't think Ryan okay. is here quite yet. Okay. Maybe we can move that uh, to the end of the agenda. Yeah, we can see if they're here in a bit. Um, we can go ahead and go through the PRs, mailing list, uh, list review, and bug scrub, and then jump back to agenda notes and open floor by chance. Does that sound good? Well, what did Edward have? Uh, did you want to just move on to Edwards? We can do that. Um, Edward, do you want to speak to that? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm in the middle of the rain here, so I hope you can hear. So yeah, we can hear. I was, I was like uh, doing some uh, work on, on the source code in Covert, Covert, and. Uh, I saw, I assumed something in the past and it seemed not, not to be correct. So I'm, I raised this question and I didn't go to, uh, internally in, I tried to ask some people and I didn't get an answer. So maybe here I will get it. Do you, we, in order to configure interfaces, uh, networking, we have two, two entries to And we link the interfaces to another entity that is a network and the API. But the relationship, I thought originally that the relationship is uh, many to one, like uh, multiple interfaces can point to the same network. What it seems is incorrect. I mean, I'm sure it's incorrect. I checked it. it it's, the relationship is, is one to one. So I was wondering what was the original reason to have this uh, two entities and not only one. I think I can answer that. Um, so it's similar to the reason why we have volumes and disks. We have the, the back end and kind of the front end separation. Uh, we see the same thing with pods as well, where they have uh, things like volumes and then volume mounts. So you take the back end thing, the volume, and you describe how it's being injected uh, into that specific container with the volume mounts. Uh, we, we followed that same approach when we were designing the, the VMI API, where we would have uh, volumes and then you would attach it using a specific disk and the disk bus and things like that. And the same thing extended to networks where we would have a, a network provided by some CNI plugin or whatever. And then we would have the binding mechanism, I believe, uh, in the interface. So that's describing how. Um, and the fact that these things are separated um, that was for consistency, 
but um, we we definitely had the discussion of what it would look like to combine these things into the same structure and kind of describe them and it could, you know if there is a one to one relationship describe them as that uh, and kind of lock them uh, into the same structure. I don't know if we felt confident that that would be the case at the time. And uh, we also, for consistency, liked to maintain that separation for uh, network, the same as we did for storage and potentially other things in the future as well. But there's a, there's a good argument both ways, I think. Okay, so so if I'm getting this correct, if I understand it correct, the network is supposed to be the CLI, more or less. And uh, and the interface is supposed to represent what's inside, what gets inside the, the guest, right? Yeah, exactly that. Um, and then the settings yeah. that you would put on the interface, these would be the settings that you would put on the virtual interface. And that's a kind of a logical separation. Okay. But, okay, so the, the confusing part for me was that network is, like the CNI is just a connectivity connection, it's not really a network. And the network is actually the what that network is pointing to. Like it points to a pod, or like the default pod network, or it points to some multiple uh, network attachment definition. And, and that was like, uh, I thought it represents, it, it's like, it was confusing in this sense. Like, because it makes sense to have multiple interfaces having the same network in theory, but it's not, you don't represent it in the API. You are supposed to represent it by pointing to the same multiples, I guess, none, right? Something like that. Anyway, you, I think you answered my question. Thank you. I was on mute. Okay. Um, yeah, so just to summarize uh, the way I understood it is we have the two different objects. We have the, the network and the interface definition. Then the network piece has a number of different possible tunings, um, whether um, you're using Multis or not. And then the interface also has uh, several different tunings. So logically grouping those separately allows you to maintain a clearer API spec while um, uh, maintaining the, the features that you need to expose in each of those. Um, a lot of them can be one-to-one, -one, but ultimately um, there are deltas between those two parts of the spec. Does that answer the question there and that, that you've dropped on the agenda, Edward? Um, I think so, yes. The summary is uh, complicated here, but uh, yes, I guess, I guess this is more or less the case. If I if I were to argue today, I guess I will I will argue that it should be one because it just complicates the user that needs to define it. But uh, but the reasoning, the original reasoning, makes sense at least now that it is explained. I think at the very least we have to have the separation between the front end and the back end. Uh, so those could have exist in the same hierarchy where you'd have um, like a, an interface on the domain which described the, uh, the back end and the front end separate structures, but they were all like in the same um, like list unit in that list. That just looked really odd in comparison to how we did volumes and other things. Uh, to describe things that way. Because for example, we didn't do that with disks. We didn't have volumes being described with the disk in the same entity. We, we had that split. So it seemed natural to have the same split for the network. Yeah, but I think that the only reason, I, I understand what the point that you're making here. I think the, the only, I mean, the point that how can I hear? If, if someone new now comes to the to the API and wants to understand it, I think in the in the current state it's it's pretty 
I mean, it's not natural, I would say, or not trivial, because usually he will set, like in any other system, he wants to set uh, some properties like the mark, the, the MTU, whatever he wants to set there, he will set it in a, on an interface. And then what is used for the pod part, that, that, that's a, like a, an internal thing that needs to be adjusted to fit it. Right, it's, I mean, except having a, this interface needs to, con to be connected to a pod or to a, to a multus network, you don't really need anything else. This is actually what happens today, I guess, if I'm not mistaken. We don't have anything in the network except saying if it's multus or, uh, and what is the multus network, and if it's a pod, that's it. We don't, we don't add the details. It could have been like, instead of having the name connecting between the interface and the network could have been just, uh, I don't know, a network uh, property under the interface. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm just, when I, when I went over it, it was like uh, very odd at the beginning. So, yep, so I, I did of things across Kubernetes objects starts to get a little bit long in the tooth, but um, yeah. yeah, we're maintaining but, the consistency with the rest of the Kubernetes ecosystem with the current federation. So thank you for dropping your um, agenda note. Do we have um, who is this person again? Oh, that's, that's Ryan. Yeah. yeah hey, Ryan. okay. Ryan. Hey, I just joined. Yeah. Um, okay. hey, hey, everybody. So I, um, I added this in here. Um, it looks like um, someone left a I just saw this, so someone has a, an example. So the, uh, the, the thing I wanted to bring up was some generating the, the runtime schema, which I think is, I think it's client go um, that has this in different languages. And so it looks like Cuba already has that. I wasn't aware of this, but the, this is Python. Um, one of the other ones that, I, the one that I was specifically interested in was actually Java. Um, we had a use case um, for that, but I basically my ask was that if there was um, precedent for this and it looks like there is. So I guess my next question, I mean, what would the process look like if, if that makes sense to people like, you know, about generating, I, I've never done this before. Like, you know, what's, what does this look like? Um, I don't know, what, what do people think? Is that, um, oh. is, is Qbert uh, like, well, I'll show ask this first. Like, do you got, so from my perspective, we have a use case for doing this in Java. Does, does that make sense, like, to have another client in Java? To, like, is anyone opposed to that? Or, I, um, or like? I, I think what's interesting to me about that is um, um, I have been interested in developing for Kubevert in Pulumi and using TypeScript. So um, I, if I understand right correctly, then we, are, we could start off by defining the CRD um in a package i don't know about the kubevert um hosting of that does someone want to speak to that hey this is fabian and i think that was somebody from 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 nvidia speaking right <laughs> hey ryan long time ago let's see hey fabian and hey uh catherine good to see you uh taking us through this fantastic ride. Um, yeah, I wonder about that. I mean, um, all the binnings are interesting, right? And I think for whatever we want to host in, in Kubert, I think we have really like these standards, right? So if we have automation and some maintainer and some kind of release process, we're very flexible. Would you be willing to own it, Ryan? Yeah, um, I, I we have a use case for it. So yeah, I, that's... So what, can you tell me about the stand... Like, I, I want to write some notes here. Like, what... So tell me what... You know, what are your expectations? Like, if we were to own this, you know, what would you like? Who would you expect? How would you like? Uh, I would say the relaxed CNCF standards, right? So, some kind of CI we probably want. And um, we want to have like clear ownership and releases. Um, for a CI, for example, we should ensure that there's some kind of, you know, that, that there's the basic assumptions of our, of the users would be met, right? So, possibly even functional tests. We need to see how far you want to drive it, but at least something functional. Maybe David, you, you want to weigh in? 
What do you think? Well, I think, yeah, maybe functional. At the very least, all I want to see is automation uh, that ensures that this client stays in sync with our client Go, like our, our, our Go Lang uh, client. So as long as we have something that um, kind of keeps in sync, makes releases, uh, and ideally it's just hands off, we just bots controlling this whole thing, um, I feel pretty confident that it'll stay working. Um, we, we could write a functional test. I don't know if it's necessary. Um, sorry, I'm, I think I'm coming late to this, but what about the Swagger doc that is generated in Qbert? And we do it in CDI too. And I know that there are people, we've got bugs from people that are creating Java clients with it. I don't know if that's a good source, Swagger or not. Maybe our open API. I, I think that the Python client is generated from that Swagger. And it doesn't work though. I mean, that's what you're, you're saying there was the, this, the, No, I'm talking about someone was using the Swagger to generate a Java client and there was a bug at some point. Yeah. Um, and I think the Python client that we have, that we release is based on the Swagger too, I believe. Oh. Yeah, you remember it. Good that you mentioned Michael. Yeah, somebody has been working in a Python cloud there. Oh yeah, that's the client Python, right? Yeah. Yep. And there used to be a bug. We recently made some changes in how we publish our API and, or our Golang API, and uh, it, it's more consistent with what we see in other projects and it's easier to consume. I'd like to understand um, what other precedent the Kubernetes community has for um, other clients like Java and Python and make sure that we're adhering to those as well. Um, so I think my ask for this is, Certainly, I think that we would be willing to host a Java client, just like we're willing to host a Python client. I'd like uh, some research done to see how like the Kubernetes uh, Java client is created and maintained. I, I assume that there's one, uh, there might not be one, but I would, sounds pretty um, uh, standard. Uh, and we should be following that precedent to make sure that we're doing the same sort of automation, things like that, assuming that it's good. Uh, but that's where I would start. Let's make sure that we're following the precedent already set by the Kubernetes community. Okay. Okay. Um, I think, I mean, I think that gives me at least a path forward. I think like, so what I guess what I can do with this is, um, this is just something that's sort of, um, it's, that's something like, it's like on our roadmap. Um, but I think what I, I think would be at least the best step for me to start with is, Maybe doing so, doing um, generating the clients maybe in its own repo, just kind of testing out, seeing how it goes, and um, see how it how we're able to use it and you know, solve our use case. And then you know we can uh, maybe expand, you know, as like you know if if everything works kind of the way we expect, and we kind of follow what the the existing Kubernetes Java client has, then maybe we can. Um, you know, talk about um, some of the other components here, you know, with CI releases, repo maintainers, so on. And maybe we had us, we have that conversation of um, possibly having one and three. Yep, sounds great. Okay, cool. Okay, that's all I have for that topic. Thanks guys. You're muted. Okay. I was muted. Look at that. Sorry, the cat was going crazy in the background. I didn't want to mess with everyone on that. All right. So, um, does anyone want to speak to Open Floor? Uh, well, yeah. Let's let's let it not be silent. So, um, I think what's coming up is um, a couple of conferences, right? I think DevConf, I'm not sure if the CFP is still open, but DevConf and Fostum, it's that time of year again. Oh, Fost, DevConf actually closed a while ago, but I think uh, Piotr sent an email to Kubert Dev 
that FOSTEM CFP is still open um, in the IIS room. Uh, so whenever you have something nice to, to, to say about QBIRD in the sense of technical advancements, not QBIRD by itself, uh, but uh, what we did, what we achieved, or how you can address use cases, this is just a shout out to, to submit your paper to, to FOSTEM, which will likely be in a virtual setting, but sessions are always good, right, to share what we've been up to. Maybe some scale work. I mean, we did a lot of scale research in the last year and fixes and analyzes, but I don't see the folks being involved with it here. And then more conferences will come up. Uh, if I remember Stu, I think last year, right? There was like, what was it? Um, on your continent? Uh, we did all things open this, yeah. this year, actually. Yeah, there wasn't there um, an admin or user related, what was the Usenix or something like this? It's also coming up usually, let's see. Um, so it's just a shout out effectively to say, look at the events coming up and just a reminder that we can speak about the stuff that we're doing. Again, anyone else? And if anyone wants to speak at any of the conferences, um, but it's a little fetch high pulling the trigger, um, there are resources we can spin up to, of course, help put together a proposal and such. So don't, don't be shy on that. And with that, I can go ahead and jump over to pull requests. So it looks like we have one call out already. Another looks like no bug if you see parts. We've got it. We've got to get used to going through this part. Um, what should we be doing on this call going through the PRC? Yeah, also I think how it, did that work? Yeah. I, I think it just uh, raise a, it, I think it just to raise a, like a notice, not, nothing more. Okay. At least this is okay. what my, my intention here. It's a, it's a, there are a, in general, this specific one is a, I will call it dead code because it cannot be used. So it will be nice if we can remove it. Vladik, did, do you already have an opinion on the PR? Did you possibly look at it? Not yet, but the thing is that we, at the moment, we cannot um, merge this PR. We cannot remove it uh, because we can promise NVIDIA that um, we will allow um, them to make the changes. So they, they will be able to comply with the new um, host devices interface. And, um, um, this didn't happen yet. Yeah, Vladik, I haven't I have an update on that. We're we have um, we have some work in progress on that. So um, I don't have a date yet, but I think um, I think it'll be I think it'll be handled before the holidays. At least we've already started some some development on it. So um, I think in the next few weeks. Great. This, uh, yeah. The, yeah, so that, that's my hope. My hope is that this will be closed up for the new year and then um, then we can merge that PR. Sounds good. Thank you, Ryan. Sure. Um, anyone from here? Did bomb? Update. 
Actually, the two pairs I wanted to to draw, draw attention to to them. Which two? It's on the it's on the agenda. Oh, there they yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. On the new page break. Basically, it is uh, two pairs uh, could help us debugging uh, some flex we saw on the SRV lane. And I think both of them are GTM. I just need an approval to, to see if it's okay. Do we have any early feedback on the cloud and logging? You mean the, the other one? Yeah. So you are essentially uh, dumping to standard out the cloud init log, well, just all the cloud init related logs. Uh, yeah, from, from what I saw, that uh, would help. Uh, it, it will dump the, the VM that uh, failed. Uh, I mean, the VMs that on the failing tests, it will get, go into the guest uh, file system and uh, dump the, the outputs of cloud init. Where's this VMI type equals Fedora coming from? I mean, how, how are you detecting this a Fedora VM? And just a second. Get VMI type. That's just curious to me. Actually, I'm using uh, something uh, that's already been there. Uh, basically, we. we Basically, there is a checking for the the VMI container disk if it's a if it's a Fedora, and based on that, we connect with the right uh, login function and eventually dump the cloud unit output. Oh, I see. Okay, so it's just looking. Okay, it's looking directly at the container disk, and it has the substring Fedora in it. Then that's probably good enough for our tests. We already use that. Yeah, it seems to make sense. It's <coughs> useful for debug. Yeah, I hope we'll get something. <laughs> and the other PR is uh, is for it's for uh, getting the audit log. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it seems that we don't get uh, this log on uh, kind providers because it's a container and it doesn't have the ODD component and uh, we can trick we can trick it to to, to mount the host uh, audit logs so when the test reporter uh, is invoked it will see the logs and uh, dump uh, the correct uh, the correct uh, messages from the test interval. The audit logs is that something from SE Linux? What what is in there? Uh, yes, for what I know, it's related to SE Linux. So, but uh, why do we need the? SE Linux logs from the host that the kind cluster is running on. 
it's not just SLA Linux. There are all kinds of um, exceptions that are related to privileges. And SLA Linux is just one of the things that writes there. OK. Yeah, thanks uh, for uh, correcting me. How are you using it? Can you say it again? Sorry. I'm just curious, what are you using this for? I mean, usually we, we really use it for um, looking up. I, I want to, uh, oh yeah, so I, I want to dump this audit log because uh, I saw on few SRV lanes failures that for some reason, the there is no permissions for uh, the uh, VFIO device. And I want to see, I want to see who is trying to get it by on the audit log, but I don't have the, the log form. And, and I want to make sure that there is no, that we don't miss uh, some SE Linux uh, policies. And I want to make sure this is, this, that this is something that is uh, cast by the VM creation. See, I'm, uh, I don't have a, it's, it's like I'm uh, waving, waving my hands, but uh, I think this is this. It will help, and if it's a problem to do it, uh, we can uh, just drop it uh, later. I mean, I'm not sure if it's a problem. It's it might be confusing. So, if you look at that log, let's say you're on one of the. Um, one of our upstream um, CI hosts, that audit log is going to contain a lot of things that aren't related necessarily to that C CI run. I think that you can have lots of things happening in parallel on that machine. Yeah, but it's, it's uh, the test reporter will uh, show you the the part of the log of when the test uh, were running. So you could uh, find something that is reasonable. Would this be behavior be consistent with something that you're used to with um, general Kubernetes and regular container usage or with uh, something like OpenStack, AWS, and so on? Is like Does it represent a behavior that you're used to somewhere else? No, I just need the, I need this log from the host. I don't have it on, I, I, it's something that I can get on the, on Google CI. So I need to dump it. I, I expect to see there, that there is a problem with, there is an actual problem with the FIO permissions. And I want to see which, who, which, uh, who is trying to get them, which user. I don't think there's going to be a problem with mounting that audit log. It might not, maybe it's useful. Okay. Yeah. I, I do see something on your PR that's kind of curious. You, you remove the extra mounts. Oh, I, uh, I just, uh, I didn't really remove it. I uh, moved it. Uh, uh, a few lines uh, up. Basically, what, but what the eventually eventually the manifest will look like. Oh, I where can. every execution you will have the var, var log audit uh, mount, and only if it's a SRV or GPU provider, you will also mount the VFIO. The VFIO the Thanks for going uh, through this. That covers us for our PR. And then you. All right, so it looks like SIG scale is changing. So if you're attending that, be sure to make note. And 
meeting notes from last week were published. We started this. This is an ongoing conversation. This is um, about the guest agent and migrating from VMware. Um, I think the inclusive language uh, old posts was concluded with um, it's not a general practice to scrub old content, it's just changing the path going forward. And this one. We see any engagement that needs to happen on this one right now. And 4.8 was released. It broke some of my CI. It was great. No, sorry. No, it that the changelog on that is pretty cool. So if you haven't checked out the changelog, be sure to dive in and look at all the awesome work that's being released. We can go through the change log if anyone wants to. Looks like we have just enough time to be able to handle that. This one was an interesting thread, um, talking about how the topology uh, schedule the pods are scheduled uh, across the cluster. Uh, looks like that conversation is resolved, though. We don't really need to get into it. And what type of it got. Thank you. 
covering the flavors. Yeah, that's right. Um, so someone's requesting to understand what flavor they are uh, scheduled as inside the guest VM itself. Um, the conclusion is that that behavior does exist in some providers. So, um, but overall, the like, value of that hasn't been described. It doesn't look like a block thing, though, if we were to pursue that. And then that covers all of the more recent conversations. So I think we're good on the mailing list review. Didn't see anything that needed media attention there. Does anyone want to post any bugs um, to the bug scrub agenda that I can hone in on otherwise? Do a quick review. This is a new one. Let's need to ask for more clarity. Um, do you want me to go ahead and drop a comment on just asking for that? Or do we want to revisit that we're approaching our time? Yeah, I'm looking at this one right now. Do we have anyone on the storage team that might have any clue? Why? Um, David, I just tried this this morning, and for me it was working. So, I don't, but there was something weird with the persistent volume claim because the thing is that is empty. So it's basically generating uh, a host disk. So in my case, I got an error, um, and I, it was visible on Virtenda. I don't know, but it's a different one. So I don't know. So this but, ISO when Windows 2K. Yeah, the, the problem is not really the ISO, it's the um, hard driver that's the persistent volume claim. Yeah, that one. Yeah, uh, the, the latest one. Yeah, that, that's that's the one that is causing the lock. That's problem. a host path that could be affected by all kinds of Yeah, but at the beginning, it's an empty PVC, so we don't have a disk IMG there. I don't know if that's a problem, but uh, there are there is not enough information. So. Okay, am I back? My audio just went on the fritz. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. So does the Windows PVC that this person is using, are you, are you saying that it's empty? It doesn't have a disk in it? I, I guess I didn't completely follow. Yeah, but is it, uh, yeah, I mean, if you don't create your generate it with uh, 
manually or I think Virtandra is trying to create uh, an empty disk IMG. At least is what I got this morning. But I mean, I just did follow there is this um, tutorial that he referenced. What I think it is just... interesting is the error that he's getting um, has to do with um, access and other processes. And he's also using a host path. So depending on how he's set up, all kinds of things could possibly jump in. I almost wonder if he switched to a different storage provider, if that would go away. Yeah, it, it could be that this image actually is being locked by the process on the host. I mean, that's what the error message says. Uh, if it's on host path, then I mean, we have no guarantee what access uh, is being given to that specific file uh, because it's not being enforced, for example, by the PVC or anything like that. That's strange. And then this one was fighting, was fighting me last week, actually. Is there anything that we need to do to keep that one moving forward? Um, the VMs cannot reboot when the emulation is used. Um, I wasn't getting any useful output from any of the logs myself either. So I'd have to figure out how to dig into that further. It needs somebody to, to take a closer look at it. Okay. Essentially, I think we've established that this is a real bug. It's unclear why this is happening. All right, so let's look at Petter's last comment. He says that it was, uh, he suspected it was memory at first, that we were maybe over committing to memory uh, or something along those lines, but uh, that he was able to reproduce it even after increasing the memory on the nodes. Um, and the question is, which logs would be helpful to collect? Uh, I, th I don't know if logs would be helpful to collect. I think somebody needs to have access to that environment and debug it uh, for themselves. So it needs an engineer who's able to reproduce this and spend time with it to understand why it's happening. And it might be something that we have to raise with the QMU community even. It's unclear if this is something we can even influence or if it's something that QMU needs to address and uh, somebody just has to go through and sort through all this. That's really what it comes down to. I was, uh, anecdotally, I was able to reproduce it on kind locally. Um, but yeah, I don't know at what layer that's actually taking in it. All right, and that gets us back past last week's review. So with that, is there anything we missed on today's agenda? I don't think so. Be sure and check out the um, change log for 4.8 uh, release. And um, definitely uh, in engage us on the uh, Google group and mailing list if there's any of the um, 
conferences and upcoming talks that you'd like to schedule and or get off with. And I think that's a wrap. All right. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Have a nice day.